Welcome to Talk World Radio, a half-hour discussion of politics as if the people mattered. I'm David Swanson. This week on Talk World Radio, we are discussing U.S. resistors to World War II with Daniel Axt, who is the author of the brand new book, War by Other Means, the Pacifists of the Greatest Generation Who Revolutionized Resistance. Dan Axt, welcome to Talk World Radio. And David, thank you so much for having me. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for writing this terrific book on a too neglected uh, topic. Uh, let me ask a question that I think might occur to some some listeners and viewers. Isn't World War II the model, perfect, holy, sacred war that nobody on the good side opposed? How could how could you write a whole book about U.S. resistors to World War II? Well, that's a it's a morally complicated topic, as uh, uh, someone said recently, and. Um, I would say that um, the fact that there were resistors and the fact that they were important um, doesn't necessarily mean that there were great alternatives to fighting that war. Um, and uh, I, I would I would add, of course, that no war is a good war. Um, the question is, was it a necessary war? Was it an unavoidable war? And the the real the real interest of the book is, I think. Um, not in suggesting that we were somehow in the wrong or might have avoided fighting that war. I doubt that that was possible. Uh, the real interest is in the role that, uh, number one, the role that these pacifists during the war played in calling the nation to conscience during that war and helping us, to the extent that they succeeded, helping us to avoid um, the very things we were fighting against. Uh, uh, the tyranny and the targeting of civilians and the abuse of, of, of citizens who have rights and all of that. And in addition, the, the second interest uh, and perhaps more le enduring legacy was the role that they played in very important movements after the war, uh, the civil rights movement, the anti-Vietnam War movement, uh, the, the uh, effort against uh, nuclear proliferation, uh, the anti-colonialism in Africa and elsewhere. And, and there are pacifists all through those things. And I guess the third aspect of it that um, uh, might, be, might give us some enduring lesson is that, you know, if they were wrong about World War II, they were wrong once. Because um, to a great extent since then, America's military adventures haven't been uh, very effective or, or, or useful or in, in some cases even moral and, and maybe in more than some, I leave that to others. Uh, and so, you know, the, so, the, so that's really, that's really the point of the book. It doesn't in any way take away from those who fought in that war, including you know, my father-in-law. And um, uh, it, it, it's uh, more a matter of um, how pacifists coped in that situation and what they took away from it and the gifts that they were able to give us as a result. I, I should note that it's a wonderful and very rich and very long book. Uh, and the topic of whether the U.S. fighting in World War II was justified or not is a handful of sentences in it at the most. Oh. Uh, but but you and I will have to agree to disagree on that uh, and on its significance. I think World War II is the number one justification for outrageous military spending year after year after year. Uh, and that in dismissing these wonderful people as having been wrong, uh, you're not examining how early they were pushing for alternatives, and you're not looking at the growing and successful movement of unarmed resistance to wars that, that today looks back to people like this. Um, so, so we may agree to disagree on, on that important bit of it. And in fact, they were right, as you say, about about many things. They predicted that the war would lead to a kind of permanent state of militarism, that it would lead to a gigantic, uh, what, what Eisenhower would later call military-industrial complex. They predicted this avant la lettre, you know, military bases all over the world. Um, uh, they, they worried that uh, domestic freedoms would be curtailed as a result. Uh, and, 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 you know, there were just a num any number of, um, of things that actually did come to pass that they, that they worried about. So uh, it's, as I said, it's a, it's a complicated story, and, uh, and, they, and, and they came into their own later uh, 
when many of the other things that they believed in uh, moved to the center of the public agenda. Uh, Much of the book is wonderful, detailed biography of individuals, but just so people have an idea, what what sort of numbers are we talking about in terms of people who resisted uh, a draft and the war at that time? Well, great question. And, you know, so there's sort of circles and circles. I mean, there were something like 43,000, as I recall, um, give or take, I don't have in front of me, who, who, who were who were designated as conscientious objectors. And that gave them uh, the ability to avoid uh, combat service. It didn't free them from the obligation of service, but but combat service and for a variety of options, you know, se- several key options were available. In addition, though, there were many more pacifists than that. There were many women pacifists who were not eligible for the draft. And there were older people, of course, and, and others who were pacifists or, uh, you know, even after Pearl Harbor, America was full of pacifists, millions and millions of them in the 1930s. But as the war grew closer, and then finally after the attack on Pearl Harbor, um, that that movement mostly collapsed. Uh, Now, in addition, the book really focuses on kind of a couple thousand, that's really all, uh, who might be called radical pacifists, who who in in many cases rejected all of the alternatives of service that were available to them, who refused any um, compliance or cooperation with uh, the war, what they would have viewed as the war machine. um, And and many of them went to prison, including some very, some, some who became extremely prominent later. And that time in prison and also the time some spent in the civilian public service camps, which were these many dusty, far-flung camps run by the peace churches, those episodes of incarceration or concentration or segregation that they experienced played an important role in their radicalization, in their secularization, and in their willingness to withstand the ardors of a life of dissent and radicalism throughout the 50s and, and 60s. When when World War II began and then when the United States got into it, uh, there was, in, in fact, I, I think, and, and I think the book describes some of this, more opposition to World War II and more public debate over it, uh, at least prior to the attacks on Pearl Harbor and the Philippines and so on, than there has been to the current war in Ukraine. Uh, th- there was uh, absolutely tremendous debate and, and, and conflict over what role we ought to play in the war that was brewing in Europe, the war that broke out in September of 1939 in Europe, uh, the war that increasingly involved the United States Navy and the Atlantic. And then finally, uh, after Pearl Harbor, that, that conflict and debate was laid to rest. But it was absolutely a furious debate. We had just fought such a war 20 years earlier. People had come to feel that it was a scam. It was a waste. The, the, the 50,000 some odd Americans who died in it, it was, it was just a waste of time. I, I believe that was the number more or less. And um, nobody wanted to do it again. And, um, and, and, but some people felt we had to, at the, at the very least, support Britain. And I should note that um, there was a lot of complexity there. We see Britain today as this as this you know, brave country standing up alone to the Nazis, and, and in fact, they did. But some people said, well, wait a minute, why, um, why is it okay for Britain to occupy India and not for Germany to invade France? Why is it okay for France to occupy North Africa and, and uh, Indochina and not okay for the Nazis to march into Paris? Wh- 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 how exactly are we drawing these distinctions and on what basis? Why is should we fight Stalin? He seems just as bad. And and it, at, finally, at one point, he was, in, after all, in league with Hitler to divide Poland and invade uh, other countries. And so um, uh, it's no one can. It's very difficult to put yourself back in that situation. But it was very complex and it was a source of tremendous conflict. Very important and inconvenient uh, questions. I think even some people who are aware that there were tens of thousands of conscientious objectors and there were these radical pacifists who organized in prisons would be surprised at how much of this happened 
prior to Pearl Harbor. How can that possibly be when the United States was peacefully minding its own business, had never heard of war uh, until that unprovoked attack? Uh, what's the chronology here? Well, th that's a good uh, uh, question that you raise. And I guess I would say more the, 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 the best way to address it in a very brief in a relatively brief period is, is to say that after World War I, there was increasing disillusion. World War I was, was blamed for the Spanish, what they call the Spanish flu, a terrible devastation of that pandemic, the Russian Revolution, the Depression. Not everyone agrees that it was the cause of these, but it was increasingly popularly blamed. Uh, uh, capitalism and, and profit seeking were blamed. There were congressional hearings. You know, the arms merchants were vilified and so on, uh, merchants of death. And so, uh, by, you know, through the Depression, the feeling had grown that that war had been a waste and a, and, a, and a foolish mess that we shouldn't have gotten involved in. We should go back to our American tradition of staying behind the oceans and minding our business and dealing with everybody openly and keeping our, 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 our free hand in foreign policy. Um, and, um, and that became uh, and there was a massive student movement for peace between the wars. Students did not want war. Often the, uh, the, the faculty were more willing to be engaged in these conflicts. Remember, Japan already was fighting what had invaded China. Americans were extremely sympathetic to China, both as a victim of the invasion and culturally. Um, and um, there had been a history of missionaries. There was Pearl Buck. And so there was increasing uh, disagreement about this, but there was a massive student youth movement against war. And uh, there were annual marches and, and days off from school and so forth. And um, but um, it, war just seemed to, to, to grow closer. And, um, you know, it, it was a very difficult problem. Um, we did have such a tradition of staying out. You know, we, we did join in World War I, but uh, uh, against the against Germany and the Austro-Hungarian Empire. But in fact, we did have a tradition of, of staying out to the extent we could. We obviously, um, uh, it was not a, a flawless tradition. Um, and there were a group, generally, broadly speaking, known as isolationists, who said, gee, we ought to stay out, but we should be prepared militarily. We should be strong and, and uh, we should build back the armed forces. And the pacifists said, no, any, any efforts in that direction will only lead to war. That military spending was bad, that raising a large army was bad against the American tradition and so forth. And the final point I, I think is very important and so little known today. Most of these pacifists, uh, the, the basis of their opposition was uh, religious, you know, and was spiritual. And as in most of American history, this particular, let's call it a reform movement or a radical movement, had a religious foundation, just as a, a, a abolitionism was strongly driven by, by religious faith. And uh, the later civil rights movement would would be somewhat analogous. So, yeah, uh, and, but the draft registration and draft resistance and incarceration and beginning to organize to desegregate prisons, this was happening prior to Pearl Harbor. Well, um, the, the the United States, uh, everybody knew that trouble was ahead. And Congress and the Roosevelt administration uh, adopted the nation's first peacetime draft in 1940. And this was the beginning of conflict with the radical, with, with radical dissenters against war, radical pacifists, we can call them. And, and um, some of them um, refused, even, even when they, th th there was an effort made to accommodate objectors, people of conscience, because they had been badly treated in what was called the Great War, World War I to us. And so a, a, a good effort was made to accommodate them uh, more fairly and humanely. Some would not comply even with registering for the draft and, and went to prison and opposed the war. And, um, uh, and others went uh, in various ways, serving as medics or going to the civilian public service camps. Um, and um, eventually there was disillusionment with most of these arrangements. Uh, and, um, uh, and in a way, the, ra the later radicals that uh, helped drive subsequent change were, were more radicalized by their experiences, you know, during, during that period. But a key point, and going back to your question, is that 
the war opponents understood that they weren't going to get much traction. And they, they, they focused on matters of conscience. So, for example, they said we should not round up West Coast Japanese and put them in concentration camps. That, that was very bad. And they said Hitler looks like he's trying to exterminate the Jews. One thing we could do is admit many more Jews to the United States, at least fill our quotas, and then go beyond those and admit these Jews to save them. Another thing that we, they said is we should even maybe consider a negotiated peace so that we could save Jews. Uh, they said we should not bomb civilians. Americans had been outraged at the bombing of civilians in the Spanish Civil War in, in China and, and, and by the Axis powers. And then when uh, the tides of war turned, uh, civilians were bombed in Germany and in uh, Japan in particular, and all culminating, of course, in the use of atomic weapons in uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And the pacifists were as critical as any humans could be of those things. They were outraged and they said this is a, a permanent stain on the American people. And so they did play that role. But the most, in a way, the salient, the most, uh, pr uh, f the foremost thing they did was to recognize that America's great Achilles heel was the treatment of black Americans, the second class status of black Americans, the discrimination, racism, persecution of black Americans. At that time, the armed forces were segregated. There was Jim Crow throughout the South. There was discrimination and segregation in the North. And that shift was a historic shift. Um, uh, and, and similarly, there was a shift uh, of the left away from the working class um, which supported the war, which had jobs in the booming factories and the sons of whom were fighting uh, all over the world, uh, a, a divorce in a way of the working class and uh, the radical left who turned their attention in a very different and important direction. Um, and, and that was toward civil rights. Uh, and that became a historic change because you know, 20 years later, 15 years later, they would play an important role in the civil rights movement that um, helped to transform American society. In, in fact, these World War II resistors are so central to the civil rights movement and other justice movements that if you haven't been told about them, the, the, the histories of those movements have been mis, mistold, misrepresented. Do you agree? Uh I think it's fair to say that it's difficult, if not impossible, to really understand the how this this arose and how it came about without understanding something about these pacifists during World War II. For example, the nonviolent character the, 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 that predominated in the civil rights movement and that I believe was very important to its success um, wells up through these individuals, Bayard Rustin, who was a Quaker, who served time in prison for refusing to serve in the armed forces, in the segregated armed forces. Baird Rustin later played a crucial role in um, helping Martin Luther King to see that uh, nonviolence was absolutely essential, uh, morally, practically, and otherwise, to, to the success of the civil rights movement for black Americans. And... Um, uh, th there were just, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the Congress on, of, of Racial Equality, which played an important role in the civil rights movement, uh, uh, was founded by pacifists and, the, and funded by the fellowship in its early days, Fellowship of Reconciliation Pacifist Group. And um, James Farmer, who led the organization in its a key part of its history, had been a pacifist. Uh, and um, George Hauser, a lesser known figure, but very important, was uh, a pacifist, and he also played a, a devoted himself to anti-colonial uh, efforts in Africa. So there's just a whole, uh, we, you know, without without underseeing this, you you are miss. There's a missing link in understanding these huge movements and in the the American left today. There's a, a terrific quote in the book from one of these uh, individuals when they were locked up in prison for their war resistance. And he said, the biggest single mistake the government made was introducing us to each other. I mean, was, was this the hotbed of the of the organizing was to put these people together in a prison? 
you know, I, that's a great line. I, I was really, I, I, that's a great line you singled out. I think it's by, uh, what's his name, Kepler. And um, uh, he, he, he puts his finger on something, which is that by concentrating these individuals and um, by bringing them together from around the country and different uh, social milieu and so on, um, the government created a, ki a kind of these, these hotbeds of radicalism in the uh, civilian public service camps, in the federal prisons. They, in the federal prisons, they even gave the, the, the pacifists a cause, which was desegregation. Even in the North, federal prisons in those days were segregated by race. And um, people like Bayard Rustin and David Dellinger was another one who was such a, an important leader in the anti-Vietnam War movement later. Um, they turned their energies to to desegregation of these facilities. They didn't want to eat separately. They didn't want to sit separately during movies and whatnot. And uh, they went, they you know engaged in hunger strikes and engaged in all kinds of activity strike uh, work stoppages to overcome this. And in some prisons succeeded. Uh, so there was a, a radicalizing uh, that happened, and um, uh, uh, it, 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 Kepler is absolutely right. I mean, Pacifica Radio um, uh, on the West Coast, the radical radio network, uh, has pacifist roots. Uh, and um, so um, sometimes, you know, things have uh, effects contrary to what is desired. It's, a, it's, a, it's almost an iron rule of public policy, the law of unintended consequences. And, and these people are, are very complex figures and very diverse, and there are wonderful biographies of them uh, within the book. Um, but they are often depicted as acting for the sake of their inner souls and consequences be damned. But they're also described as studying Gandhi, uh, studying Gandhi's tactics, going on to use very effective, strategic and aggressive, nonviolent activist tactics to win civil rights and, and other uh, campaigns. Uh, is it that they changed over time or what's the what's the truth of the matter here? A great question. Um, uh, in fact, I think there's a couple of things I would I would say. Um, uh, first, as you pointed out, they were diverse in their views and so on, but they, they mostly lived in the real world. For example, they understood during the war that they weren't going to stop the war, and uh, they were not going to enlist much support from the American people. They understood and, and would live with that. So they had this basis of conscience that just said, at some level, it doesn't matter what anyone say, we believe that this is, that this is right. By the same token, they lived in, in, in the real world to the extent that they could be pragmatic, many of them, particularly A.J. Musty, who headed the Fellowship of Reconciliation. And so they worked pragmatically to do what they could. As I said, they could draw attention to the plight of Japanese Americans who were wrongly incarcerated for no reason other than their ethnicity during the war, American citizens, most of them. And, um, you know, so they, they did what they could. I think they understood pragmatically that, for example, um, uh, the government was much more tolerant this time around. Uh, and in turn, though, that if they if they did certain things, it just wouldn't help and, and would l lead to them being unable to do anything else. So they they uh, walked a line. Uh, but an important thing that happened during that war is people who many of whom began with a, 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 a pacifism that was spiritual in basis and radicalism that was spiritual in basis, became more secular. Um, uh, many of, the, uh, ra of them were thrown together in prison, secular and socialist and atheist alike. And, uh, and they talked to each other and debated and changed and evolved. And uh, they, earlier than, than a lot of America, became more secular. David Dellinger, for example, was a, a divinity student when he went into prison. There was an exemption for divinity students. He wouldn't even fill out the card to claim the exemption. So he went to prison and he, and, and he grew less, um, uh, his, his radicalism became more secular. He was always a spiritual person, but less Christian. Though it was, most of this had a Christian basis. Uh, although I do give, I should note, uh, special attention to the book to the very small band of Jewish pacifists during the war. They did exist, and uh, they were an interesting special case, obviously.
We, we've got about three minutes left, Dan asked, uh, and you know, about 25 years after this, uh, my parents met at a place called Union Theological Seminary, uh, oh. which plays a big role in this story. Can you, what, what's the, why does that come in uh, to the well, count the here? Well, the first group, the very first group, before David Dellinger was a member of the Chicago 7, like in the movie, uh, you know, uh, uh, he, he was a member of something called the Union 8. And these were eight students at Union Theological Seminary in New York who refused to cooperate in 1940, before Pearl Harbor, refused to cooperate in any way, shape, or form with the draft, including availing themselves of the exemption permitted to uh, seminary students uh, 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 simply by filling out a card. And uh, they could not stomach, they said, any uh, cooperation with the, the war machine and uh, Union Theological Seminary was also the alma mater of many key figures uh, in this. I believe Norman Thomas and his brother Evan Thomas, uh, anti-war figures, socialists and pacifists. And so um, that uh, was the seat of their radicalism before uh, the draft. And they were the, 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 they started it in a sense uh, with the war. So. So uh, less than two minutes left. I, I very much appreciate all the proper credit to giving these people their due, uh, even when you disagree with them on some things. They, yeah. they are so deserving of, of recognition. Uh, but you credit them with having created a, a pacifist left in the United States, a big major leftist section of the population that is just automatically against all wars. Where are they? Can you introduce me to them? I can't find them. Well, I think that um, it's one thing to say that that um, uh, people on the political left are reflexively pacifist, which I think today they are, not just in the United States, but throughout Europe and maybe throughout the world. I mean, it's another thing to say that uh, they're going to, um, I don't know, get out in the streets and, and protest uh, military spending or or arming Ukraine or whatever. Uh, there were protests, obviously, against the invasion of Iraq. Um, and um, I think that the great bulk of Americans probably, they may not realize it, are closer to the isolationists of that period who said, let's stay out of war and let's remain militarily strong in order to do so. And again, that would not be something that uh, my pacifists or, or yours would uh, agree with or approve of, but that's sort of my reading of how people are. I mean, realistically, most people are caught up in their lives and if nobody is, in, in, is invading or bombing us, um, you know, they would just like to go on with their lives. And, and by the same token, uh, Iraq's, uh, Ukraine seems to have been invaded and, and, uh, uh, and people are sympathetic to that. And, and so um, I suspect there is significant support for, for arming Ukraine, whether it violates pacifist principles or not. Most people are not pacifists and most people are not members of the radical left. So... Well, we're going to have to come up with some pacifists in time of war, not just vegetarians between meals. Uh, we've been speaking with Daniel Axt about this wonderful brand new book, War by Other Means, the pacifists of the greatest generation who revolutionized resistance. Dan Axt, thank you very, very much for coming on Talk World Radio. David, great conversation. Thank you so much. This is Talk World Radio. I'm David Swanson. Take action at rootsaction.org. Help end war at worldbeyondwar.org. Read or listen to today's Peace Almanac entry at peacealmanac.org. All past shows can be heard at talkworldradio.org. Talk World Radio is produced in Charlottesville, Virginia, and syndicated by Pacifica Network. There is no way to peace. Peace is the way.